Section 17 of the Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 1, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. Eleonora of Aquitaine, Chapter 2. From the time of the marriage of her daughter Matilda to the Lion of Saxony, Eleonora had not visited England. The coronation of her eldest son and the murder of Becket had occurred while she resided in her native province. She had seen her son Richard, in 1170, crown the Count of Poitou, with all the ceremonies pertaining to the inauguration of her ancestors. But King Henry only meant his sons to superintend the state and pageantry of a court. He did not intend that they should exercise independent authority. And Richard's will was curbed by the faithful Norman veterans pertaining to his father. These castellans were the real governors of Guienne, an order of affairs equally disapproved of by Prince Richard, Queen Eleonora, and their Aquitanian subjects. The Queen told her sons Richard and Geoffrey that Guienne and Poitou owed no obedience to a king of England, or to his Normans. If they owed homage to anyone, it was to the sovereign of France. And Richard and Geoffrey resolved to act as their Provençal forefathers of old, and pay no homage to a king of England. All these fermentations were approaching a violent crisis, when Henry the Second, in the summer of 1173, arrived with his son, the young king, in Guienne, to receive the long-delayed homage of Count Raymond of Toulouse, and to inquire into the meaning of some revolts in the south, against his Norman castellans, evidently encouraged by his wife and Prince Richard. It was part of the duty of a feudal vassal to give his sovereign advice in time of need, and when Raymond of Toulouse came to this part of his oath of homage, as he knelt before Henry the Second, he interpolated it with these emphatic words, Then I advise you, king, to beware of your wife and sons. That very night the young king, although he always slept in his father's bedroom, escaped to the protection of his father-in-law, Louis the Seventh. From Paris he made all manner of undutiful demands on his father. Simultaneously with the flight of young Henry, his brothers, Richard and Geoffrey, decamped for Paris. Richard's grievance was that his wife, the Princess Alice of France, was withheld from him. While Geoffrey insisted, as he had arrived at the mature age of sixteen, that the Duchy of Bretagne and his wife Constance, whose dower it was, should be given to his sole control. Reports had been brought to Eleonora that her husband meditated a divorce, for some lady had been installed, with almost regal honors, in her apartments at Woodstock. Court scandal pointed at her daughter-in-law, the Princess Alice, whose youthful charms, it was said, had captivated her father-in-law, and for that reason the damsel was detained from her affianced lord, Prince Richard. Enraged at these rumors, Eleonora resolved to seek the protection of the King of France, but as she was surrounded by Henry's Norman garrisons, she possessed so little power in her own domains as to be reduced to quit them in disguise. She assumed male attire and had traveled part of her way in this dress, when Henry's Norman agents followed and seized her, before she could reach the territories of her divorced husband. They brought her back very rudely, in the disguise she had adopted, and kept her prisoner in Bordeaux, till the arrival of her husband. Her sons pursued their flight safely, to the court of the King of France. Now commenced that long, dolorous, and mysterious imprisonment, which may be considered the third era in the life of Eleonora of Aquitaine. But the imprisonment of Queen Eleonora was not stationary. We trace her carried, with her royal husband, in a state of restraint, to Barfleur, where he embarked for England. He had another prisoner in company with Eleonora. This was his daughter-in-law, the young Marguerite, who had contumaciously defied him, left the royal robes he had made for her coronation, unworn upon his hands, and scorned the crown he had offered to place on her brow, if not consecrated by Becket. With those royal captives, 
Henry II landed at Southampton sometime in July 1173. Henry II proceeded directly to Canterbury, carrying the captive queens in his train. Here he performed the celebrated penance so often described at the tomb of Becket. We have no new light to throw on this well-known occurrence, except the extreme satisfaction that his daughter-in-law Marguerite, who was in the city of Canterbury at the time, must have felt at the sufferings and humiliation of the man who had caused the death of her tutor and friend. Scarcely had King Henry completed his penance, when tidings were brought that his high constable had defeated Prince Richard and the Earl of Leicester, near Bury. And this news was followed by a messenger announcing the capture of King William the Lion, at Alnwick, and that the royal prisoner was approaching, with his legs tied beneath his horse the most approved method of showing contumely to a captive in the Middle Ages. All this manifested very clearly to the Anglo-Saxons that St. Thomas had forgiven his royal friend and was now exerting himself very actively in his behalf. But when, within a very few hours, intelligence came that the fleet of the young King Henry, which had set sail to invade England, had been entirely demolished by a storm, public enthusiasm for the saint knew no bounds. The king went to return thanks to St. Thomas, at the shrine before which he had done penance, and the peace of the kingdom was wholly restored. Then was Queen Eleonora consigned to confinement, which lasted, with but short intervals, for sixteen years. Her prison was no worse place than her own royal palace at Winchester, where she was well guarded by her husband's great justiciary and general. Renolf de Glanville, who likewise had the charge of the royal treasury at the same place. That Glanville treated her with respect is evident from some subsequent events. The poor penitent at Godstow expired in the midst of these troubles, not cut off in her brilliant youth by Queen Eleonora, but from slow decay by pining. She was nearly forty and was the mother of two sons, both of age. She died practicing the severest penances, in the high odor of sanctity, and may be considered the Magdalene of the Middle Ages. Tradition says she declared on her deathbed, that when a certain tree she named, in the convent garden, was turned to stone, they would know the time she was received into glory. She died deeply venerated by the simple-hearted nuns of Godstow, who would have been infinitely scandalized had she received visits from Henry. Nor does one of the many church manifestos, fulminated against Henry, charge him with such an aggravation of his offenses as the seduction of a nun, an indubitable proof that the conventual vows had effectually estranged Henry and Rosamond. As the Princess Alice was still betrothed to Prince Richard, no one dared to hint at anything so deeply heinous as her seduction by her father-in-law, for the vengeance of the victorious Henry would have severely visited the promulgators of such a scandal. The public, finding that the queen was in prison on account of her restless jealousy, compared the circumstance of the death of Rosamond, and revived the old story of Henry's passion for the penitent of Godstow. From this accidental coincidence, of Eleonora's imprisonment and Rosamond's death, the memory of the queen has been unjustly burdened with the murder of her former rival. Henry the Second seems to have indulged his eldest and his youngest son, with the most ruinous fondness. He always kept them near him, if possible, while Prince Richard and Prince Geoffrey, equally beloved by their mother, were chiefly resident with her on the continent. Prince John had entirely an English education, having for his tutor that learned ecclesiastic, allied to the Welsh royal family, well known to historians, as the chronicler Geraldus Cambriensis. But small profit, either to his country or to himself, accrued from the English education of Prince John. Through the mediation of the King of France, his father-in-law, the young King Henry was reconciled to Henry II for a time, and his young queen Marguerite was restored to him. King Louis himself visited England in 1178, for the purpose of praying for his son's health, at the shrine of St. Thomas a Becket. Notwithstanding the singular relationship in which the kings of England and France stood to each other, as the former and present husband of the same queen, they appear to have frequently met in friendly intercourse. Henry received Louis with much respect, and rode all night, August 18th, with his train, 
to meet Louis the Seventh at Dover, where the chroniclers relate that Henry made many curious observations on a total eclipse of the moon, which happened during his nocturnal journey. A fact reminding us of his fondness for scientific questions, as recorded in his character by Peter of La. Henry the Second afterwards took his royal guest to his Winchester Palace, where he showed him his treasure vault and invited him to take anything he chose. Queen Eleonora was then at Winchester, but whether she met her divorced lord is not recorded. In the course of a few months, Louis the Seventh died of a cold caught at his vigils near the tomb of Saint Thomas a Becket. Such was the end of the first husband of Eleonora of Aquitaine. To enter into a minute detail of all the rebellions and insurrections undertaken by the insurgent sons of Eleonora during their mother's imprisonment, were an endless and indeed an impractical task. It must suffice to hold up a picture of the manners and temper of the people over whom she was the hereditary sovereign, and who disdained the rule of any stranger, however nearly connected with the heiress of their country. All the elements of strife were kept in the perpetual state of activity, by the combativeness of the troubadours, whose ten songs, or war songs, perpetually urged the sons of Eleonora to battle, when they were inclined to repose. Such, among many of inferior genius, was Bertrand de Bourne, Viscount de Hauptfort, whom Dante has introduced with such terrific grandeur, in his Inferno, as the mischief-maker between Henry the Second and Prince John but he began this work with Henry's eldest and best-beloved son. Bertrand, and all the other troubadours, hated Henry the Second, whom they considered as an interloper and a persecutor of their rightful princess, the Duchess of Aquitaine, his wife. It is said that Bertrand was in love with Queen Eleonora, for he addresses many covert declarations to a royal Eleonora in his chansons, adding exultingly that they were not unknown to her, for she can read. But there is a mistake of the mother for the daughter, since Prince Richard, who was a brother troubadour, encouraged Bertrand in a passion for his beautiful sister Eleonora, and to the daughter of the Queen of England, not to herself, these passionate declarations were addressed. In the midst of insurrection against his sire, the mainspring of which was the incessant struggle to obtain an independent sovereignty, young Henry Plantagenet died at the castle of Martel in Guienne, in his twenty-eighth year. When he found his illness mortal, he was seized with deep remorse, for his frequent rebellions against his ever-indulgent father. He sent to King Henry, to implore his pardon for his transgressions. Before he expired, he had the satisfaction of receiving a ring from his sire, as a token of forgiveness. On the receipt of this pledge of affection, the penitence of the dying prince became passionate, when expiring, he caused himself to be taken out of bed, and died on sackcloth and ashes, as an atonement for his sins. The death of their heir for a short time reconciled Queen Eleonora and her royal husband. Henry mourned for the loss of this son, with the deep grief of David over Absalom. The contemporary chroniclers agree, that from the year 1183 to the year 1184, when the princess Matilda, with her husband, Henry the Lion of Saxony, sought refuge in England. The captive queen was restored to her rank at the English court. Prince Richard, now become the heir of Henry and Eleonora, remained some time quiet, in order to see how his father would conduct himself towards him. Although he had arrived at the age of twenty-seven, and the princess to whom he was half-married was twenty-three, she was still detained from him. Richard had formed, at Guienne, an attachment to a virtuous and beautiful princess, the daughter of a neighboring potentate, and he was anxious that his mysterious entanglement with the princess Alice should be brought to a termination. Richard seems to have met with naught but injury from his father, nor was his brother Geoffrey much better treated. The continual urgency of Prince Richard, in regard to the princess Alice, was met with constant evasion. Reports were renewed of the king's intention to divorce Queen Eleonora, and the legate resident in England, Cardinal Hugo, was consulted on the practicability of this divorce, and likewise on the possibility of obtaining a dispensation for the king's marriage with some person nearly allied to him. 
The consequence was that Prince Richard flew to arms and got possession of his mother's inheritance, while Queen Eleonora was again committed to some restraint in Winchester Palace. The lengthened imprisonment of Queen Eleonora infuriated her subjects in Aquitaine. The troubadours roused the national spirit in favor of their native princess, by such strains as these, which were the war songs that animated the contest maintained by Richard in the name of his mother. Daughter of Aquitania, fair fruitful vine, thou hast been torn from thy country and led into a strange land. Thy harp is changed into the voice of mourning, and thy songs into sounds of lamentation. Brought up in delicacy and abundance, thou enjoyest a royal liberty, living in the bosom of wealth, delighting thyself in the sports of thy women, with their songs, to the sound of the lute and tabor. And now thou mournest, thou weepest, thou consumest thyself with sorrow. Return, poor prisoner, return to thy cities, if thou canst. If thou canst not, weep and say, Alas, how long is my exile? Weep, weep and say, My tears are my bread both day and night. Where are thy guards, thy royal escort? Where thy maiden train, thy counselors of state? Some of them, dragged far from thy country, have suffered an ignominious death. Others have been deprived of sight, others banished and wandering in divers places. Thou criest, but no one hears thee, for the king of the north keeps thee shut up like a town that is besieged. Cry then, cease not to cry. Raise thy voice like a trumpet, that thy sons may hear it. For the day is approaching when thy sons shall deliver thee, and then shall thee see again thy native land. These expressions of tenderness for the daughter of the old national chiefs of Aquitaine are followed by a cry of malediction against the towns which, either from force or necessity, still adhere to the king of the foreign race. Woe to the traitors which are in Aquitaine, for the day of their chastisement is at hand. La Rochelle dreads that day. She doubles her trenches, she girds herself all around with the sea, and the noise of her great works is heard beyond the mountains. Fly before Richard, Duke of Aquitaine, ye who inhabit the coast, for he shall overthrow the glorious of the land. He shall annihilate, from the greatest to the least, all who deny him entrance into Sancton. For nearly two years the Agavin subjects of Henry the Second and the Aquitanian subjects of his captive queen gave battle to each other, and from Rochelle to Bayonne, the dominions of Queen Eleonora were in a state of insurrection. The contemporary chroniclers who beheld this contest of husband against wife and sons against father, instead of looking upon it as the natural consequence of a divided rule in an extended empire, swayed by persons of great talents, who had received a corrupt education, considered it as the influence of an evil destiny presiding over the race of Plantagenet, as the punishment of some great crime. Many sinister stories relating to the royal family were current. Queen Eleonora, when pursuing in her early days her guilty career as Queen of France, it was whispered had been too intimate with Geoffrey Plantagenet, her husband's father. Then the story of Folk the Red, the first that took the name of Plantagenet, was revived, and the murder of his brother discussed. Likewise, the wonderful tale was remembered of the witch countess of Anjou, Henry the Second's great-grandmother, wife of Folk Le Rechin, or the quarreller. This count, having observed that his wife seldom went to church, and when she did, quitted it always at the elevation of the host, thought proper not only to force her to mass, but made four of his esquires hold her forcibly by the mantle when she was there, when, lo, at the moment of consecration, the countess, untying the mantle by which she was held, left it in the hands of the esquires, and flying through the window of the chapel, was never heard of more. A great thunderstorm happened at the moment of her departure. A dreadful smell of brimstone remained, which no singing of the monks could allay. The truth of this marvelous tale probably is, that the countess was killed by lightning, in a church injured by a thunderstorm. Her ungracious descendant, Richard Coeur de Lyon, used to tell this tale with great glee to his knights at Poitou, and added, Is it to be wondered that having sprung from such a stock, we live on bad terms with each other? 
From Satan we sprang, and to Satan we must go. Geoffrey held out Limoges in his mother's name, with great pertinacity. Among other envoys came a Norman clerk, holding the cross in his hand, and supplicating Geoffrey not to imitate the crime of Absalom. What, said Geoffrey, wouldst thou have me deprive myself of mine inheritance? Is it the fate of our family that none shall love the rest? Hatred is our rightful inheritance, he added bitterly, and none will ever succeed in depriving us of it. During a conference, which Prince Geoffrey soon after had with his father, in the marketplace at Limoges, for the purpose of discussing peace, the Aquitanian soldiers and supporters of Geoffrey, full of rage at the sight of the monarch who kept their duchess imprisoned, broke the truce, by aiming from the castle a shower of crossbow shafts at the person of the king, one of which came so close as to shoot his horse through the ear. The king presented the arrow to Geoffrey, saying, with tears, Tell me, Geoffrey, what has thy unhappy father done to thee, to deserve that thou, his son, shouldest make him a mark for thine archers? Geoffrey was greatly shocked at this accident, of which he declared he was wholly innocent. It was the outbreak of popular fury in his mother's subjects. When Prince Richard and Prince Geoffrey were not combating with their father's subjects, they employed themselves in making war on each other. Just before the death of Geoffrey, his brother Richard invaded his dominions in Bretagne, with fire and sword on some unaccountable affront, blown into a blaze by the servants of the troubadours. After this faction was pacified, Geoffrey went to assist at a grand tournament at Paris, where he was flung from his steed in the midst of the melee, and was trodden to death beneath the feet of the coursers. He was buried at Notre Dame. This was the second son Queen Eleonora had lost, since her imprisonment, in the very flower of his youth and strength. Like his brother Henry, this prince was remarkable for his manly beauty, and the agile grace of his martial figure. His death afflicted his mother equally with that of her firstborn, for Geoffrey had been brought up a Provençal, and had shown far more resentment for his mother's imprisonment than the young King Henry. That Eleonora loved both with all a mother's passionate tenderness, we have the evidence of her own most eloquent words. In one of her letters to the Pope, preserved in the collection of Peter Blas, she says, The younger king and the count of Britagain both sleep in dust, while their most wretched mother is compelled to live on, though tortured by the irremediable recollections of the dead. The dislike that Queen Eleonora manifested for the widow of her son Geoffrey is one of the circumstances that float like straws on the stream of common history, without any one defining from whence it came. A passage in the Newbury Chronicle, hitherto little noticed, casts some light on this aversion, which certainly did not commence, on the Queen's part, till after the death of Geoffrey. From it we find that the misfortunes of Prince Arthur began before his birth, and were strengthened by his baptism, on the 29th of March, 1187. The Duchess Constance brought this heir of misfortune into the world a few months after the death of his father. Eleonora, the eldest child of Constance, had been proclaimed heiress of Bretagne, but was disinherited on the birth of her brother. It was the pleasure of King Henry and Queen Eleonora that the infant should be named Henry, but the Bretons chose to indulge their natural prejudices in favor of King Arthur, whom they claim as their countrymen and as they looked forward to the boy as the possible heir of England, they insisted on giving the last descendant of the Armorican princes that favorite name. This was the first public displeasure given by Constance to the parents of her husband. Their enmity increased with years. Great scandal arose after the death of Geoffrey, regarding the Duchess Constance and her brother-in-law, John. Till his marriage with Isabella of Angoulême, he was constantly haunting her, and on this account, it is supposed, Henry the Second, after the birth of her posthumous son, Arthur, forced the Duchess to marry the Earl of Chester, as Prince John's attentions to his sister-in-law caused considerable comment. Prince Richard having got possession of the whole Aquitaine, his father commanded him to surrender it to his mother, Queen Eleonora, whom he had brought as far as Normandy to claim her right. The moment the prince received this mandate, he gave up the territory and hastened to Normandy to welcome the queen and congratulate her on her restoration to freedom. 
This release is recorded by the friend of the queen, Abbot Benedict. From him we learn that, during the year 1186, Eleonora exercised sovereign power at Bordeaux, and then resigned it to her son Richard, who, in the meantime, had made peace with his father. Henry II was with his queen during this period, for Benedict declares that, the following April, they sailed from Barfleur to England. Eleonora was once again put under some restraint at Winchester Palace, which she quitted no more till the death of King Henry, three years afterwards. The commission of moral wrong had involved Henry, great and powerful as he was, in a net, within whose inextricable folds he either vainly struggled, or awaited the possibility of deliverance by the death of the queen. If Eleonora had preceded him to the grave, as in the common course of nature might have been expected, he would have sued instantly for a dispensation to marry the affianced bride of his son. While the queen lived, this could not be done without an explosion of scandal, which would have dishonored him in the eyes of all Europe. Henry had only two alternatives, either to permit his heir to marry the princess Alice, or to shorten the life of Queen Eleonora by violent means. Although his principles were not sufficiently firm to resist indulgence and guilt, he was not depraved enough to commit deliberately either atrocity. So time wore uneasily on, till Prince Richard attained the age of thirty-four, and Alice that of thirty. While the king still invented futile excuses, to keep his son in this miserable state of entanglement, wherein Richard could neither free himself from Alice, nor give his hand to any other bride. Yet Richard, to further his own ends, made the brother of Alice believe that he was willing to complete his engagement. It was the wish of Henry the Second to crown his son John, King of England, during his lifetime, and to give Richard all his dominions that lay beyond the English sea. Richard was not content. He came to the King of France, and cried for aid, saying, Sire, for God's sake, suffer me not to be disinherited thus by my sire. I am engaged to your sister Alice, who ought by right to be my wife. Help me to maintain my rights and hers. The King of France, after vainly seeking for explanation of the reason why his sister was not married to her betrothed, made, with Prince Richard, an appeal to arms. King Philip contrived to induce Prince John to join in the rebellion. When Henry heard that this idolized child of his old age had followed the insurgent example of his brethren, he threw himself into a paradoxum of rage, and invoked the bitterest curses on his head, and that of Prince Richard. He cursed the day of his own birth, and, after giving orders to his painter at Windsor, to paint a device of a young eaglet pecking out the eyes of an eagle, as a reproach to Prince John, he set out for the continent in an agonized state of mind. After waging for the first time in his life an unsuccessful war, King Henry agreed to meet his son Richard and the King of France at Vézelay. As the king was on his progress to this congress, he fell ill at Chinon after indulging in one of his fits of violent passion. Finding that his life was departing, he caused himself to be carried before the high altar of the cathedral, where he expired in the supporting arms of Geoffrey, the youngest son of Rosamond, who was the only one of his children from whom he received filial attention in his last moments. Before he died, he spoke earnestly to his son, and gave him a ring of great value. Then laying his head on the bosom of Geoffrey, his spirit departed, leaving his features still convulsed in the agony of rage, which had hastened his end. When the news was brought to Richard, that the crown of England had devolved upon him by the sudden death of his father, he was torn with remorse and regret. He went to meet the royal corpse at Fontaraud, the place of internment pointed out by the will of the deceased monarch. King Henry, when he was carried forth to be buried, was first apparelled in his princely robes, having his crown on his head, gloves on his hands, and shoes on his feet, wrought with gold, spurs on his heels, and a ring of gold on his finger, a scepter in his hand, his sword by his side, and his face uncovered. But this regalia was of a strange nature, for the corpse of Henry, like that of the conqueror, had been stripped and plundered, and when those who were charged with the funeral demanded the ornaments in which Henry was to lie in state, the treasurer, as a favor, sent a ring of little value and an old scepter. As for the crown with which the warlike brow of Henry was encircled, 
it was but the gold fringe from a lady's petticoat torn off for the occasion and in this odd attire the greatest monarch in the world went down to his last abode thus he was conveyed to the abbey of fontaraud where he lay with his face uncovered showing by the contraction of his features the violent rage in which he departed when richard entered the abbey he shuddered and prayed some time before the altar when the nose and mouth of his father began to bleed so profusely that the monk in attendance kept insistently wiping the blood from his face richard testified the most poignant remorse at this sight he wept bitterly and prostrating himself prayed earnestly under the mingled stimulus of grief and superstition and then rising he departed and looked on the face of his sire no more henry died july sixth eleven eighty nine the first step taken by richard i on his ascension to the english crown was to order his mother's release from her constrained retirement at winchester palace from a captive queen eleonora in one moment became a sovereign for the reins of the english government were placed in her hands at the time of her release she made a noble use of her authority according to a manuscript cited by tyrrell eleonora of guienne directly she was liberated from her restraint at winchester was invested with full powers as regent which she most beneficially exercised going in person from city to city setting free all those confined under the norman game laws which in the latter part of henry's life were cruelly enforced when she released prisoners it was on condition that they prayed for the soul of her late husband she likewise declared she took this measure for the benefit of his soul her son had given her full power but to her great honor she did not use it against those who had been her jailers or enemies her regency was entirely spent in acts of mercy and wisdom and her discriminating acumen in the prisoners she liberated may be judged by the following list she liberated fully all confined for breach of forest laws who were accused of no further crime all who were outlawed for the same she invited back to their homes and families all who had been seized by the king's arbitrary commands and were not accused by their hundred or county she set free but all malefactors accused on good and lawful evidence were to be kept in prison without bail when we consider eleonora going from city to city examining thus into the wrongs of a government that had become arbitrary and seeing justice done to the lowest we are apt to think that her imprisonment had improved her disposition the queen regent next ordained that every freeman in the whole kingdom should swear that he would bear faith to his lord richard son of king henry and queen eleonora for the preservation of life limbs and terrene honor as his liege lord against all living and that he would be obedient to his laws and assist him in the preservation of peace and justice eleonora showed so little distaste to the winchester palace that she returned thither after her justiciary progress to await the arrival of her son from the coast of normandy it appears that king richard when he gave commands for his mother's release ordered her castellan the keeper of the treasure vault at winchester renolf de glanville to be thrown into a dungeon in winchester castle and loaded with fetters weighing a thousand pounds our ancient chroniclers when laboring to reconcile the prophecies of merlin with the events of english history while hunting after the impossible very often start some particulars which would otherwise have slept shrouded in the dust of the grave thus speaking of the liberation of eleonora of aquitaine by her son richard i matthew paris says she is designated by merlin's sentence aquila repti fideris tercia nidificatione gaudabit the destructive eagle shall rejoice in her third nestling eleonora pursues matthew is the eagle for she spreads her wings over two nations england and aquitaine also by reason of her excessive beauty she destroyed or injured nations she was separated from the king of france by reason of consanguinity and from the king of england by divorce upon suspicion and kept in close confinement she rejoiced in her third nestling since richard her third son honored her with all reverence after releasing her from prison if matthew could imply that henry confined eleonora for impropriety of conduct he is not supported by other authors king richard i landed at portsmouth 
August the 12th, 1189. Three days after, he arrived at his mother's court at Winchester, where his first care was directed to his father's treasure. After he had conferred with his mother, he ordered before him Renolf de Glanville, who gave him so good an account of the secrets of the Winchester treasure vault, that he set him at liberty, and ever after treated him with confidence. Either Renolf de Glanville had behaved to the queen, when his prisoner, with all possible respect, or Eleonora was of a very magnanimous disposition, and forbear prejudicing her son against her late castellan. Glanville gave up to the king the enormous sum of nine hundred thousand pounds, besides valuable jewels. At his first seizure, only a hundred thousand marks were found in the treasure vault, which, it seems, possessed some intricacies only known to Glanville. The king's next care was to settle the revenue of the mother he so passionately loved, and whose wrongs he had so fiercely resented. Her dower was rendered equal to those of the queens Matilda Atheling and Matilda of Boulogne. The king's coronation took place on the 3rd of September, 1189, as the etiquette of the queen mother's recent widowhood prevented her from sharing in the splendid festival. All women were forbidden to be present at its celebration. The chroniclers declare that Richard issued a proclamation the day before, debarring all women and Jews from entering the precincts of Westminster Abbey at the time of his inauguration. A classification of persons greatly impugning the gallantry of the lion-hearted king when we remember the odium attached to the name of a Jew. The Provencal alliance had produced a prodigious influx of this usurious race into England, as they enjoyed high privileges in the hereditary dominions of Queen Eleonora, they supposed they were secure under her son's government. Believing that money would buy a place everywhere, they flocked to the abbey, bearing a rich present, but the populace set upon them and slaughtered them, being excited to a religious mania by the preaching of the crusade. The massacre of these unfortunate money brokers was not perpetrated with the connivance of either King Richard or the Queen Mother, since Brompton expressly declares that the ringleaders were, by the king's orders, tried and put to death. Alice, the long-betrothed bride of Richard, was neither married nor crowned. On the contrary, she was committed to the same species of restraint, by the orders of the queen, in which she herself had been so long held captive. The princess Alice had been twenty-two years without leaving England, and as she was the only person on whom Eleonora retaliated any part of her wrongs, the inference must be drawn that she considered Alice as the cause of them. Eleonora departed for Aquitaine as soon as her son had settled her English dower, and Richard embarked at Dover for Calais, to join the crusade, taking with him but ten ships from the English ports. His troops were disembarked, and he marched across France, to his mother's dominions, where he formally resigned to her the power he had exercised, during his father's lifetime, as her deputy. Richard appointed the rendezvous of the crusade at Messina, and directing his mother to meet him there, he set sail from Marseilles for Sicily, while Eleonora undertook a journey to Narve, to claim for him the hand of Berengaria, the daughter of King Sancho. Richard had much to effect at Messina, before he commenced the crusade, before he struck a blow for Christendom, he was obliged to right the wrongs of his sister Joanna, Queen of Sicily, the youngest daughter of Eleonora and Henry the Second. William the Good, through the recommendations of Peter of Blois, who had formerly been his tutor, asked the hand of Joanna Plantagenet of her father. The Sicilian ambassador granted Joanna an immense dower, but when the aged bridegroom found that his young queen was still more beautiful and sweet-tempered than her father's chaplain, Peter, had set forth, he greatly augmented her dower. The king of Sicily died childless, leaving his young widow great legacies in his will. King Tancred robbed her of these, and of her dower, and to prevent her complaints, enclosed her in prison at Messina. It was this outrage Richard hastened there to redress. But the list of goods the fair widow directed her brother to claim of Tancred could scarcely have only existed in a catalogue of Aladdin's household furniture, an armchair of solid gold, footstools of gold, a table of the same with tassels, twelve feet long, besides urns and vases of the same precious metal. These reasonable demands were enforced by the arm of the mighty Richard, who was obstinate and willful as Achilles himself.' 
Tancred deserves pity when we consider the extraordinary nature of the legacy. However, he compounded for dower and legacy at last, with the enormous payment of 40,000 ounces of gold. This treasure, with the royal widow herself, were consigned to Richard forthwith. Thus was a companion provided for Richard's expected bride, the elegant and refined Berengaria, who, under the conduct of Eleonora of Aquitaine, was daily expected. Richard was so well pleased with the restoration of his sister and her treasures, that he asked Tancred's daughter in marriage for his then acknowledged heir, Arthur of Bretagne. During this negotiation, Eleonora arrived in Messina, bringing with her the long-beloved Berengaria. Although it was long since Eleonora had seen her daughter Joanna, she tarried but four days in her company, and then sailed for Rome. There is reason to suppose that her errand was to settle a dispute which had arisen between King Richard and his half-brother Geoffrey, the son of Rosamond, whom the king had appointed Archbishop of York, according to his father's dying request, but had required an enormous sum from the revenues of the archbishopric. Queen Eleonora returned to England with her friend the Archbishop of Rowan. He was soon after appointed its governor, in place of Longchamp, who had convulsed the country by his follies. We have seen Eleonora taken from captivity by her son Richard, and invested with the high authority of Queen Regent. There is no reason to suppose that that authority was revoked. For, in every emergency during the king's absence, she appears as the guiding power. For this purpose she absented herself from Aquitaine, whose government she placed in the hands of a deputy, her grandson Otho of Saxony, and at the end of the reign of Cour de Lyon, we find her, according to the words of Matthew Paris, governing England with great wisdom and popularity. Queen Eleonora, when thus arduously engaged in watching over the interests of her best beloved son, was approaching her seventieth year, an age when rest is imperiously demanded by the human frame. But years of toil still remained before her, ere death closed her weary pilgrimage in 1204, and these years were laden with sorrows, which drew from her that pathetic alteration of the regal style, preserved in her letter to the Pope, on occasion of the captivity of Cour de Lyon, where she declares herself, Eleonora, by the wrath of God, Queen of England. Not only in this instance, but in several others, traits of the subdued spirit of Eleonora are to be discovered for the extreme mobility of her spirits diffused itself even over the cold records of state, when in bitter grief she subscribes herself, in ira dei, regina anglorum, and Eleonora misera, et utinam miserablis anglorum regina. When swayed by calmer feelings, she styles herself, Eleonora, by the grace of God, humbly queen of England. Eleonora of Aquitaine is among the very few women who have atoned for an ill-spent youth, by a wise and benevolent old age. As a sovereign, she ranks among the greatest of female rulers. End of section 17. End of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 1, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland.